I am the bread of life, said Jesus. Well, these words form part of that great discourse that follows on from the feeding of the 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000, that amazing event, made a huge impression upon the multitudes. The people were eager, possibly for more free food, possibly for more signs and wonders, and so they got into boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. Straight away, as the crowds begin to gather around Jesus, he questions and probes their motives. You are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate loaves and you had your fill. The multitudes were excited. They'd had a free meal. I suppose we'd all be excited if there was a free meal on offer somewhere. We'd probably go and eat our fill. Perhaps they imagined they'd get another free meal if they went and followed Jesus and found him elsewhere. The multitudes were excited about temporal things, earthly blessings, worldly problems, the food that spoils. He'd fed the multitudes. He'd satisfied their physical hunger. But Jesus was concerned now about deeper issues, about the things of God, about the things concerning his Father. And he desired to impress upon that crowd a sense of their own inner need, their own spiritual need. He urged the people, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures unto eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. We know that the pursuits of this world's pleasures, the pleasures of the physical life, much of what this world affords, spoils quickly. Wonderful though many, many things are, which we enjoy thoroughly, they don't last forever. Just a few days ago, I had a birthday. I can't believe where the years have gone. We look in the mirror, don't we, and we expect to see that young face staring back at us, and we're amazed at what we see. <laughs> well, I certainly am anyway. I don't know where the gray has come from. Physical things do fade and spoil. We well know that the fleeting promises of the fading attractions of this material world, although they satisfy in one sense, don't really satisfy the deepest needs of the human soul. The soul was made for God, and it's God alone who can satisfy our immortal yearnings and aspirations. The food which the world offers to us may interest us, may engage us for a time. Such things may gratify our senses and fulfill us in, in many different ways. Perhaps the world's food satisfies our ambitions, our hopes, sometimes some of our desires, but they, the world's food can never really satisfy that deepest longing within. We often find that even after we've struggled and labored and worked hard to reach the highest peak that we can of our earthly ambition, after we've sometimes enjoyed those greatest pleasures that the world affords, well, there's still something that seems to be lacking. I've told you before of Lord Byron and what he said on this subject. He said that he'd drunk every cup of joy, but still died of thirst because there was no more to drink. I think, he said, I've had 10 happy days, truly happy days in my whole life. Work for the food that endures, Jesus says. 
He urges his listeners to work for that food, the true, the abiding, the permanent reality, that reality that's unreached by the powers of decay, untouched by the ravages of time, defiantly indifferent even to the approach of death. All that belongs for the spiritual life, labor for this. For there we find there is an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It's this food for which Jesus bids us labor. And so if this is true, well then the life of faith must be the great business of our living. The Christian life can't be confined to an hour on a Sunday morning, but it must become for each of us an integral part of our day-to-day -day living, thinking, and speaking. We must work at our spiritual lives. We must endeavor to grow, grow closer in our relationship with this God in whom we trust, grow in our fellowship with him, grow in our prayer life, grow inwardly, spiritually. The Christian life is a life that's nourished by the living presence of Christ within. Jesus, in this reading, is saying to us that he gives himself as our nourishment, our sustenance, that he is the one upon whom our spiritual lives depend. He offers himself as food for humanity. I am the bread of life, he says, and he places himself at the disposal of each one of us. And so this process of feeding upon him might be made more real and tangible to us. Well, on that night in which he was betrayed, he took some bread and he broke it and he shared it with his friends. And then he poured out wine and shared that with them. Bread and wine, ordinary food and drink, symbols of the food of immortality, channels through which the life of God is imparted to the soul. I am the bread of life, says Jesus. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, Whoever believes on me shall not thirst. The one who eats and drinks my flesh and blood has eternal life, and I shall raise them up on the last day, Jesus says later. Here is nourishment for our journey. Here is inspiration for our work. A vision of Christ's kingdom is here. This table stands in our midst today reminding us that the living bread must be truly a part of our daily living. It reminds us that we must take Jesus at his word, that we must take the one whom we encounter here and then take him out into our workplaces, into our community, into our street, our neighborhood, back to our families and our friends. The broken bread the wine outpoured speak to us of love and sacrifice. And they tell of the ultimate purpose of human life. And so we feed upon Christ, the living bread, so that his life might be made increasingly manifest within our own living. We live a so that we might ourselves be transformed by Christ into his own image, to become what we were created to be. But the image of Christ is only formed within us as individual men and women to the, de to the degree to which we partake of that living bread. And so he cries, feed upon me, eat of me and live. A person's life does not consist of the abundance of their possessions, we're told in Luke's gospel. Jesus insisted, work for the food that does not spoil. Paul reminds us that the things we see are merely temporal. The things that are not seen 
are the things that are eternal, the things of lasting significance. We know these things to be true, but do we partake of that living bread that's offered freely to each of us? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Do not work for the food that spoils, but for the food that endures unto eternal life. For what do we labor? For what do we struggle? To what do we aspire? Do we look for that food that spoils? Or to that food that endures unto eternal life? If we're ever to find completeness in life, satisfaction for our souls, we must feed upon that living bread, upon Christ, that bread which the Hebrews gathered in the wilderness that satisfied a nation. So the Hebrews gathered that bread we heard in Exodus, and that bread satisfied that nation for a time. Jesus can satisfy the whole world. Unlike that bread that we looked at earlier that satisfies the human body, Jesus has come to satisfy the human soul. Unlike that bread which satisfies us only for a brief period, Jesus will satisfy forever. Jesus satisfies us universally, comprehensively, permanently, when we partake of him by faith. Believe, and you have eaten. Sir, give us this bread, they cried. And he will give freely, abundantly, and we shall be satisfied. Amen.